Lloyd built the ark out of gopher wood. The flood it came and the ark it stood. And those arks are moving and moving and moving. And those arks are moving and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh, no, no. Now who built the ark? Oh, oh no, no, my lord. No those arks are moving and moving and moving. And those arks are moving and moving along. March the animals two by two, the hippopotamus and the kangaroo. And those larks are moving and moving and moving, those larks are moving and moving along. Who built the ark? Oh, no, no. Now who built the ark? Oh, no, my lord. No larks are moving and moving and moving, no larks are moving and moving along. I'm Chris Breslin for Bob Crawford. Welcome to RTN Theology number 25. Our time apart in quarantine has many of us busier than ever. It turns out it's hard to communicate from a distance and by means of technology. So for this episode, I actually had to go it without my regular co-host and co-producer Bob Crawford, as he's got the end of semester blues this week and didn't have enough space uh, to get on this call. But it, as I've also seen... Our time apart has has really given us a lot of creative energy in a lot of ways and and allowed us to connect uh, in ways that we wouldn't normally or with people we wouldn't normally. So I got to include a dear friend of mine, John J. Alvaro. He's the pastor of First Baptist Church, Pasadena, California. John J. and I knew each other in divinity school. He was uh, an an awesome uh, colleague and classmate. We took a lot of the same courses together and had a lot of the same interests. I particularly remember taking a course called Preaching the Powers and Principalities with Chuck Campbell, and that was a course that I took because John Jay suggested it. Uh, He was also a fierce member of our many championship uh, intramural teams, including an all-campus champion softball team and a dodgeball team. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, people were uh, pretty skeptical about our uh, growth in Christ and our sanctification because of uh, what we fielded uh, during those games. But uh, John Jay is a bit of a, a wild man. And when I scheduled our guest for this episode, Jay Kim, author of a new book called Analog Church, the first and only person that I thought of to help me out with this when when Bob couldn't help me out was John Jay. Uh, John Jay has long been um, an artist but before even a preacher or minister. And as a preacher and minister, he is also still an artist, uh, but also a really discerning and critical voice when it comes to our use of technology. So I love this conversation right now because almost all of us are relying on technology more than we normally would and oftentimes in ways that we're not even totally comfortable with. And so this was a really critical, but also I think constructive look at how we use technology in the area of faith, but also just uh, in general in our lives. Uh, I love this conversation. It was so much fun connecting with an old friend and a new friend in Jay Kim, and I think you'll love it too. Here today with Pastor Jay Kim, the pastor of Analog Church, Why We Need Real People, Places, and Things in a Digital Age that just came out via InterVarsity Press. And I have a special 
co-host today, an old friend. Well, he's not that old, but he and I go way back to our time here in Durham, North Carolina at Duke Divinity School. And now he is the pastor of First Baptist Church in Pasadena, California. If you type it in, you have to make sure you say California or it'll take you to another FBC Pasadena. Um, I'm joined by uh, John Jay because I, I couldn't think of a, a zanier or more creative or a sane person to talk about church and technology. And that's what we're going to be talking about today uh, during this this really strange time where, um, where we're all, uh, to some extent, uh, grappling with our limitations, being apart, and uh, relying on a lot of forces of technology to hold us together. Uh, so first off, our uh, podcast is called uh, RTN Theology, and the RTN stands for Road to Now. And with all of our guests, uh, and now my co-host, guest co-host, uh, I'd love to hear, uh, Jay, your road to now, your personal uh, road to um, uh, what you're doing these days and how this book came about. Yeah. Well, um, happy to be on. Thank you guys so much for, for taking some time to chat and, uh, geez, that, that's a really big question. Uh, Chris. Um, yeah. I mean, if I were to start at the beginning, I guess it's important for me to start with, uh, the, I was, I was born actually on the other side of the planet <laughs> from where I live now. I was born uh, on the Western seaboard of, of South Korea in a city called Incheon, which was a small city when I was born there. Uh, and, and supposedly it's a big town, big city now. Um, but I, I don't remember growing up there because my mom and I moved um, to California uh, before I can remember when I was really little. So we moved kind of right into the heart of the Silicon Valley. And that's where I've been basically my entire life. I've grown up uh, in, in the Silicon Valley, um, in San Jose and, and uh, other parts, suburbs of San Jose. Um, and yeah, I mean, the journey to the book, you know, I've been in local church ministry, um, serving and leading in some uh, form or fashion in, in a local church for the last 17 years or so. And um, probably the last five, maybe six years, I really started for, for a variety of reasons. I really started thinking uh, deeply and then eventually critically about the intersection between uh, the digital age and the technologies of the digital age and our ecclesiology. And uh, I didn't expect it to happen. I wasn't planning for it. I, I wasn't, you know, necessarily like I didn't have any sort of vested interest in it uh, other than the fact that the church, uh, the churches that I've been a part of all um, in their own ways sort of uh, were, were highly interested in leveraging uh, as much digital technology as possible for the sake of, you know, impact or reach or whatever, all those sort of cliche Christian growth words. And, um, and, and that's not bad in and of itself, but I, I, uh, what I saw was we were sort of leaning into digital technologies, assuming that it was all good, you know, as long as it gave us more opportunity to, to reach more people or whatever, we just assumed that was a good thing. But um, as I continued using digital technology in my own life, uh, you know, over time I realized, oh, like this isn't just neutral. This stuff is forming us, you know, it has formational effect on our lives. And, and it's interesting because it's the formation is both subtle and uh, emphatic, you know? And yeah, that's right. um, so I just started asking that question. It's like, oh man, if, if that's happening in my own life, and we're using digital just sort of unabashedly just leaning so hard and heavy into all things digital in our church, man, that, that, that can't, I, I can't possibly imagine that it's neutral. It must be doing something to our ecclesiology. So, you know, the way we understand the church. So uh, yeah, that was probably five, six years ago. I started, you know, sort of that started rumbling around in my head and, and there you go, you know, here we are, wrote a book. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, you you kind of coined the term analog church uh, for this book. Uh, how would you define analog? Uh, I know what I think of when I mm -hmm. hear the word analog, but uh, what were you thinking? 
Yeah, I think I mean very very simply put by analog uh, what I'm try- I'm int- I know the word has some elasticity of meaning but I'm intending to use the word um along the lines of you know physical tactile embodied realities. Uh so when I say analog church what I mean is the church as a physical tactile embodied reality the theological word for it might be incarnational. Yeah, um, sure. So that that's the point I'm trying to make that in light of the the digital age and its technologies which are by their very nature designed to give us a sort of feeling of pseudo connection while disembodied that's the nature of digital technology. Um you know that that there is the absolute need for again embodied incarnational experiences uh, as the people of God. So uh yeah I think I think that's what I mean. It's been fascinating like I you know, I, I grew up, I'm like a zillennial or whatever. Right. I don't know how yeah, sure. are, but like that weird hybrid. Yeah. Do you pronounce the X? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I know. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like you're a Gen X slash millennial type thing. And I, I just assume because for zillennials, we grew up, uh, we sort of lived that transition, you know, we're, we're bilingual, essentially. We lived that transition from an analog world to a digital world. Yeah. Like I still remember buying um, cassette tapes, you know, like sure. my first, uh, TLC album was a, <laughs> was a tape, you know, and, and then, and then, uh, yeah. So like what I realize now is a lot of people don't know what analog is, you know? So I've had to answer that question. Um, but there you yeah. go. Yeah, I think we're all of the same generation. I just gave my daughter, we're doing some homeschooling. I just gave my eight-year-old a, um, I think like a 13 or 14-year-old MacBook that doesn't have a camera on it. Yeah. Uh, and and it's useless to her. Uh, you know, she, <laughs> all of her second grade classes are via zoom or whatever. Oh, yeah. and, and she's like, what am I going to do with this dad? And yeah, I was like, totally. let me tell you about the internet <laughs> and before the internet, you know? Yep. Um, yep. So John Jay, tell our listeners a little about uh, your road to now where you've been and, and where you join into this conversation. Yeah. So I, um, I think we're probably all about six months apart in age. It sounds like an, an experience. Like I was taking notes for Jay here, um, living in that gap and that in between time. We'll talk a little bit later about the technologies we're engaging right now and the ways we're doing so, I think with some critical posturing, but also having to embrace them at a level I'm, I'm not comfortable with, but it's kind of where we are right now. But part of my own journey to this point is how, how to reintegrate analog to use the sort of physical tactile embodied language that Jay used back into digital processes. So they have a texture um, that is placed back into reality. So like I've been, you mentioned TLC on cassette tape. I've been finding old cassette tapes in the church and at home and trying to resample those back into music making as a way to kind of keep both of these worlds in conversation when it feels like the entire analog world is disappearing. Um, my journey to this point now around technology, and I've done a little bit of writing in essays and other places on this. Um, I got really obsessed with preaching and teaching uh, and rhetoric whenever we were in grad school together, Chris. So I like took all the preaching classes I could. And some of this sort of uh, the disembodied satellite church kind of mega church model was really catching on and it was all predicated on scalable digital technologies and how, again, I'm thinking everything that Jay said deeply resonates with me. Like nobody was questioning the medium as a formative tool itself and just assuming that any new medium, any new form could be re-leveraged for spiritual formative purposes. And it just didn't make sense to me, especially because some of the folks who were doing this were like, kind of the worst sort of uh, religious leaders. And so I was like, okay, okay. I started doing a lot of research in visual cultures, oral cultures, reading, you know, Jacques Ellul, Walter Ong, uh, Athanasius on the incarnation and developed in that line of critique, kind of a larger understanding of what technology was. I also will say I have a very, I've written this in some other places. I have a very addictive personality. 
And so I became quite aware early on that these tools were incredibly addictive and they were deforming me personally. And so a lot of my own sort of thinking about digital technologies was in part my own personal vulnerabilities to them. And I've had to recognize that that's not everybody's vulnerability. Like my wife is very adept at moving in and out of digital spaces and does not find herself as deformed as I do. Um, but because I was so susceptible, I thought there must be something here that is not exactly for my flourishing. And that allowed me, I think, some space to think. So I've pulled, you know, over the course of the last few years, I've taken myself out of a lot of social media kind of connected technologies. Like I've tried to separate out the idea of connected technologies and just other digital technologies that may not have as much persuasive effect inside of them. Um, but as I've dropped those off, I've also came to this new role at, at First Baptist Pasadena and decided like, what would it look like in one place to, there's this line in um, Jaron Lanier's book on 10 arguments for deleting your social media where he says like, you could talk to a lot of people and say very little, which I think is how I was operating in social media spaces, or you could talk to a few people very deeply. We have a church that worships about 200 on a Sunday. Like that's not a ton, a ton of people, but I am able to speak very deeply. And so I've tried to keep them in view with whatever it is that I create uh, with technology. And in this new world, which we've got to be talking about right now, like that's become really, really hard and important at the same time. Um, I still love preaching and I also have to watch my ego all the time. And so I think that's the space where I can feel a lot of tension is when does my role as a speaker and a teacher turn into like another opportunity to boost ego. And that's always kind of keeping me cautious, I would say. Yeah. Um, and I'm incredibly thankful, Jay, for what you've already said and that this book exists. The fact that you're embedded in Silicon Valley, like as I moved to the West Coast, I'm from New Orleans originally, I, I thought, oh man, like I'm right in the thick of it now, but not as much as you being in Southern California versus Silicon Valley. So yeah, that's me. Cool. Yeah, very, very good. I, I probably should have mentioned when John Jay ta uh, talks about his his pre uh, predilections for preaching. Um, I don't know if you still do this, but uh, you used to preach from just an open moleskin with very little text and a lot of color. Like it was basically a painting that you would preach from. Do you still do that? Yeah, I've actually moved the painting to an app because we have a screen now in the service so I can move that. But yeah, it's illuminated. Uh, California preaching. gotcha. Yeah, California <laughs> gotcha. Uh, very good. Um, each of you in either an illusion or directly mention Athanasius and the incarnation. Um, the, the, the thing that, that I, I was thinking about was uh, another major church figure that we've spoken about on the podcast with James K. Smith was Augustine um, talking about, um, and Thomas picks this up too, the, the difference between using and enjoying. And it seems um, technology generally, but specifically digital technology. I don't want to paint too broad of a brush because like you, then you're really susceptible to like, Oh, you don't like penicillin, right? Like <laughs> penicillin was a technology that saves lives, right? Um, you're recording on the internet. Yeah. But this idea of, of, of our, our use of things that, that should just be useful to us and be tools that like really elides into our enjoying the things that we should use and, and, and somehow mutates our desires so that we start to enjoy the things that we should use and use the things that we should be enjoying. Um, Jay, I, I don't know how, how close you are with, with movers and shakers in Silicon Valley, but that like, I, I know there's been some discussion lately about how some of these technologies have purpose to do this, right? Like, um, have purpose to be addictive. Like they're talking about social media, the way, you know, I'm in Durham, North Carolina, the, the way they talk about tobacco in, in terms of uh, intent and desire to uh, become addicted, uh, addictive. Do you, do you have any ear on that conversation where you are? Yeah, I mean, just by sheer fact that, you know, this has been home for me for, gosh, I, you know, my almost 40 years or something. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm surrounded by folks, friends and family. Uh, most of my family actually work in tech and in big tech and in startup world. 
Uh, and then, of course, our church, you know, our, our church and every church I've been a part of um, in, in my 17 years of local church life. Um, yeah, there's just an overwhelming population of folks who work in tech and make the stuff that, you know, we use all the time. So uh, that's been helpful in one sense because it, you know, just because of the, the sort of proximity to the people who make the stuff and then conversations with them about their process of making it, yeah. you know, it helps me a little bit. I mean, it helps me a little bit to see it for what it is. Uh, probably a little more often than, than most, most people. And what I mean by that is like when I'm staring into the dark abyss of my phone, you know, I've become sort of much more acutely aware that while on one level, it feels like I'm just going on this really fun journey, scrolling through social media, looking at images and Twitter and whatever. On the other hand, the most real thing happening is that I'm sitting in a physical room, usually surrounded by real people staring into a black box, you know, and that like, that's the real thing that's happening. And so that's been helpful. Um, and a part of the reason why that's been helpful to get to your question, you know, uh, John Jay mentioned uh, Jerome Lanier and he writes beautifully and, and prophetically in some ways about this, but uh, as, as others have as well, there's a real thought behind the way digital design is constructed, right? And uh, there's a guy named Tristan Harris who has, he used to be a design ethicist for Google. Mm -hmm. And he's publicly on the record, he said he left that role and he started this uh, sort of nonprofit to raise awareness of ethical design. And he's on the record said he left Google, and I'm not bashing Google, this is just the, the reality. He left Google because he realized that he was in his role so that Google as a company could at least say, we're thinking about the ethics of design. Mm -hmm. But he realized that his suggestions and his initiatives, none of them were happening because to design ethically in the digital age is to compromise uh, the sort of unrelenting pursuit of capturing our attention and then our eventually our allegiance. And the way digital technologies do that is to keep us scrolling and swiping and clicking, right? Like that is, that's the nature of monetization in the digital yeah, world. That's right. Like that's how it's, it's like if you open a restaurant, the, you, it's just baseline understanding the way you make money is to feed people food, right? But the reality is when it comes to food, for example, if I go to a restaurant and I get a burrito and I'm done with that burrito, there's a limit, right? That I viscerally, incarnationally in the flesh feel like I'm done. The pleasure, you know, the pleasure is gone. If I eat more beyond this point, then it's no longer pleasurable. I, it's, it's painful. Um, so, the, the dangerous thing is when it comes to digital technology, that appetite is endless, right? The, the way digital technologies are designed, they've tapped into something in us neurologically that um, keeps us clicking and swiping. They've sort of hit a gold mine of commodity, right? It's like, oh my gosh, there's an endless, bottomless um, well of commodification that is possible in human beings if we can design our technology a particular way to keep them swiping, clicking, and scrolling and whatever. And that's what's happened, right? So in that way, um, yeah, I, I, that it's, it's intentional, you know? <laughs> like, and we sure. can get into the details of that, but uh, there's, there's deep intentionality, which is why I think when it comes to um, a Christian, the follower of Jesus, man, it's so important that we think critically again about the way this stuff is forming us. Cause if we're, if we don't think about those things, you know, the reality is like something is always forming us. You, you were mentioning Jamie Smith, who you've had on your podcast, you know, he's got this great line in uh, you are what you love, where he says all human beings live leaning forward right? We, we are all sort of headed toward a particular telos, a particular end. We have no choice in that matter. The only choice we have is what telos, what end, you know, in which direction are we leaning? And if we're not careful, if we're not thoughtful in the digital age, the technologies are just going to default us into leaning in a particular direction. Here we you
you are, here you are, the beautiful one who came as a son, here you are. So we lift up our voices and open our hands to cling to the love that we can't comprehend. Lift up your voices and lift up your heads to sing to the one who has freed us from. And helped to kind of think um, critically about these things and, and not in a way that is overly curmudgeonly or uh, removes me from culpability or agency. But um, I don't know if you're familiar with this, this book. I, I don't know that it's super widely read, but it should be uh, called The Dangers of Christian Practice by Lauren Winter. It, she's one of John Jay in my professors, but this book, she was working it out while we were there and we had no idea what the heck was going on most of the time, but it's come to fruition. And she talks about the term she uses is characteristic damage, the inherent uh, deformations in good things in Christian practices. So Mm. she talks about prayer, baptism, uh, Eucharist and you know Eucharist she talks about and we're gonna have her on the show sometime we got derailed with all of the coronavirus stuff uh, and the change in school but um how something is beautiful and a gift as Eucharist can have this characteristic deformation um, because it remembers Christ's death and has been historically used for anti-Semitic pursuits. And, and similarly, like, so, so there are these like baked in things um, that th- these characteristic damages or, or deformations. And so that's helped me to be able to think about something uh, again, that I use a, a tool, the internet, my phone, even things now that more and more of us are using like zoom and, and to think, to embrace the gift and possibility of them, but also to always be aware of this like characteristic deformation in the way that it does form us, you know, um, and potentially malform us. Uh, that that's been helpful to me. John Jay, you have a, um, you, you alluded to it, but you have a portion on your website that says no social media question mark. And, uh, you've had to break that, um, uh, I'd love to hear how how your folks have embraced or bucked against that decision and maybe the strangest question you've gotten on that from a, a visitor or a newcomer. Yeah, so um, my predecessor here was solidly or is solidly in the boomer generation. And, I, you know, I've found like audio cassette tapes of his early sermons. And so from his time until he retired, transitioning from that to um, my podcasting, his stuff is such a huge gap. And so they had built up a certain amount of social media in a way that like a lot of churches sort of open these accounts, they pump them for a little bit and then they fall dormant. And so when I got here, yeah, I had already developed a lot of reticence and I had enough permission to change some of those structures. And so we just changed them really early. And I said, okay, if we've got a chance to build a culture, what's the like, what's our guiding set of principles and convictions around technology and embodiment and local gathering? And then we just from the ground up kind of changed our programming, made everything about the website that felt like, like we, I have a friend who's a great designer, so he built us a really great website, but also 
it allowed us to create a quiet environment online for people to engage our stuff. I think part of pulling out of social media wasn't to pull off of the web, but to pull off of the really noisy environments that push people in other directions. Um, for instance, like we don't, we don't put our stuff on YouTube. We put it on Vimeo because Vimeo is a lot quieter than YouTube. It's got a, an algorithm that I think is more friendly and kind and it's all of those sort of things. And so um, we focused a lot of our attention on our website and then focused a lot on opting in. So rather than blasting everyone and their friends with what we were doing, we offered at regular intervals, here's where we're hosting a certain number of things. Um, if you would like to, to be no, to be notified about that, then there are a couple of ways you can do that. And we just kind of let that be what it was. And we had some pushback. Honestly, we got a lot of pushback from folks who were really active on Facebook because more and more of like our old, our parents generation, like Facebook is the space where they spend a lot of time online. It's not a space that, I mean, I'm assuming y'all probably aren't crazy active there. And I remember getting an account in college for Facebook, but, uh, I, um, I got a lot of pushback there and I just had to sort of hold and trust that the reasons we weren't creating like a Facebook ad and buying ad time for every single event we were doing was thought driven. And we tried to slow down all of the things. We, we basically added friction into the system, which technology tries to pretend that you can remove friction and scale infinitely. And I thought, Hey, I don't want a church to grow that fast. Like I'd like to be manageable, but also, I want to make sure I'm talking to these people. And every yeah. time, every time I changed my thought around, well, we could reach more people. I forgot I was speaking to these people. And even in this new world, that's what we've done is we've, we haven't like pushed up our social media presence. We've changed our entire website and basically tried to create, again, I think a quiet and kind place for people to get to know our community and for our community to speak to one another and for folks who want to opt in and listen, they can. Um, but it's, to me, it's the difference between like setting a table in your living room and talking versus like putting a loudspeaker on your front porch and blaring it to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the front door is open. People can wander in as they would like to, but that's the way that we've continued to think about these things and I don't know if it's right. Uh, you know, we don't live stream our services. We're doing a lot of audio only stuff because I think, and I'd love to hear Jay, how you've thought about like oral cultures versus visual cultures and the ways that those things compete. Um, but that's the way that we've thought about it here. And, and again, I don't think I've gotten a ton of, of pushback for it. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah, that my context. I, in, in my context, I, you know, we planted our church about five and a half years ago. And so I've, I've been able to generate some of this from scratch with some of my own inclinations, never using stock art when you could use a real person, which is pretty hard when you start a church from scratch and you don't have real people, <laughs> you know? Um, but I, I'd be curious, Jay, um, coming into an existing congregation and all of these, you know, your own personal evolution of these ideas, like how do you change people or, or maybe people that you've engaged with and talked to uh, pastors with these ideas that want to change their situation? How, how does that happen or can it? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I love, I love some of the stuff that John Jay's talking about it, You know, that's great food for thought for me, you know, and, and some of the stuff we do, uh, a lot of it sort of, it's like, oh man, it's affirmation. Like our, uh, anything on video for us at our church also lives on Vimeo. And it was the same, uh, conversation we had, we were like, man, YouTube is noisy and we don't want to throw people, send people to a place that's going to, potentially, you know, harm them with a crazy rabbit hole of videos on the side. And, you know, people who don't know what we're talking about, that's probably kudos to you for not even knowing. It's like, what, Vimeo, YouTube, who cares? Uh, but Vimeo, like you said, John Jay, is like much, much quieter. I love that, that phrase you use, you know, it's a much kinder sort of algorithm. And yeah, I love that. Uh, so, but at the same time, you know, we do have, we're still on social media, but some of the stuff you're talking about, you know, sort of inviting people in rather than blasting it out, man, those are, that's great stuff. Um, I, as far as, you know, sort of trying to push and prod and, and, and provoke really is what I hope to do, provoke uh, people in general and then church leaders in particular in a particular direction uh, when it comes to the digital analog sort of dichotomy. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing, I just think posture matters so much more than my position, you know? So that's not like a great thing to say in terms of promoting sales of my book, (laughs) you know? But the reality is like, I just think anything, you know, I, I, I obviously offer a particular position in the book, but I I hope that more than the position, you know, people sort of get a sense for my posture, which is primarily, and I can, I I mean this genuinely, I'm, I'm really driven just by a love for the people of God and specifically the gathered people of God and what they look like and what they're going through and what their individual stories sort of the, the mosaic it creates in the collective story of particular local communities. And I do not, know what that looks like. I don't know all those stories and I don't know what the mosaic of all those stories collectively look like for each church. I only know what that looks like for us, you know, at our church and and what works for us. So while I do have, you know, theological reasons really, as well as philosophical reasons for, um, for example, in the book, I get into like why you know, the video venue model of, of the mega church sort of thing. I just think there's theological reasons why that doesn't work and, and it, it falls short, you know, but at the same time, I, I, I want to be sure that it's not, you know, nobody makes that change just because I wrote a paragraph about it in a book or you read, you know, a John Jay article about it. I hope it comes about because we all do the difficult work of not just like exegeting the scriptures, but exegeting our community and exegeting our, you know, the culture, the micro cultures that we're a part of in the cities or towns where we live and serve. And um, that sort of work is so important. And, and I'm confident that when people do that work, they will get to a place where they recognize uh, universally sort of the inherent dangers that are laced into the disembodied realities, which are our digital technologies with all of their sort of addictive um, tendencies, you know? So yeah, I don't know if that even answers your question. Yeah, no, I had heard someone, someone online made, you know, and, and again, this is to certainly acknowledge and, and, lament this current crisis that we're in and what it is doing to people and what it has done and the threat that it poses. But so that's the, <laughs> that, that, that's my footnote uh, for this, but so, someone had, had made like the crude analogy uh, in, in terms of technology that it was like, you know, when you're a kid and, and you got caught trying at smoking cigarettes and, and you're, uncle made you smoke the whole pack or whatever like that that is us right now on technology <laughs> you know it's like oh you you want technology yeah. you want disembodied <laughs> social connection here you go that's all you got right and, and it's yeah. making us sick you know you go for it judge well that so there's a, a go back to Jaron Lanier he talks about this in this really fun way where he we would do these virtual reality experiments. He put people in the headset, immerse them in this digital world. Often it would have these textures of like psychedelic flowers. But then when he would pull them out of it, he talked about putting like a real flower in front of them as they came out of the digital space. And there was this moment of transcendence and encountering the real. Mm, and yeah. I think that that's the piece I keep holding on to about this crisis is like, yeah, it hurts. We miss our people. To me, holding that pain all the time as a point of tension, it allows me to crave that flower that will appear in the real whenever we come out of this moment. Um, And I'm hoping for that. Yeah, it it does make me wonder, like, you know, you hear in previous generations that that lived through the Dust Bowl and Great Depression and like, uh, especially the, the kids that were kind of formed beyond what they knew that they were experiencing and, and, you know, they don't waste anything and hold, and, and, you know, aren't super extravagant and, and tend to, you know, they're, they're the people that, and like, I, I do it a little too, like put water in the bottom of the ketchup bottle and like use it all. Right. You know, sort of thing. But like, I wonder that about our kids, you know, during this time, if there might be some sort of social outworking, of this, like to have, even just for a season, have experience like, oh, I don't get to see my classmates. You know, I don't want to live as if like that is, that is possible again. You know, like um, I'm going to hold this differently, right? Yeah. Like I'm hopeful as well that, 
this is doing something in us um, that heightens our awareness of the thing that we've, you know, always longed for, but maybe t- took for granted or, or didn't live with sort of the, the depth or uh, yeah, the depth of awareness of just how desperate we are for, for embodied presence with one another. It's pretty interesting. Like in our neighborhood, um, my wife and I will take our two kids out for a, uh, you know, walk usually after dinner. Um, the last couple of days up here have been beautiful. So we've been just going for a stroll around the neighborhood and everyone's doing the six foot distancing thing, you know? And so like often there will be runners like joggers and, and they'll be coming toward us on the sidewalk and they see that we've got two little kids. So they're really almost always really kind and gracious and they'll run off out into the street. Dude, I have said I have waved hello and made eye contact with more neighbors that I don't know in the last okay. two weeks than I have in the last two years. Because when you're even six to ten to twelve feet apart, it's exactly what John Jay is saying about that Jerome Lanier uh, experiment. It's like you come out of your virtual reality home where you've had all these Zoom meetings all day and you know FaceTime chats and stuff, and you breathe the fresh air of real life, and you're surrounded by trees and flowers. And then the pinnacle of creation, another embodied human passes by and there's just a magnetic sort of like hello you know and a draw and these are like people I don't know and I'm really introverted actually and you know I struggle to connect with people on a deep level but man I feel it now just a couple weeks into the sheltering in place I see these people running by and there's something in me that's like I wish we could stop and you know share a chat and high five or you know like there's a thing yeah i'm hopeful about that i grew up i grew up in florida and florida you do a lot of boating and so i've told my my wife that like everyone's a boater now because when you pass someone in a boat you wave and it's kind of like i'm okay are you okay like if you don't wave you might be kidnapped or something yeah. right? like, uh, and so yeah, everyone's like a boater just in the yeah. middle of their neighborhoods. Um, it seemed another thread that, that you were um, using to define analog was all together in one place that I, I saw that kind of combination of words come up several times, including in relation to music and singing, you, um, you sprinkled throughout are these wonderful uh, extended thoughts from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who um, thinks so much about unison singing and community through oral sounds and, and through vocals, not able to be like precisely not able to be all in one place. Um, and, and it even makes it more challenging to be all together at the same time. Um, what have you done? Um, this, is, I guess, is where the rubber hits the road for, for your book, for your role as leading people in a congregation. What, what have you done to approximate that or to, to get close to that? Um, yeah, you know, first of all, I'd love to hear some of John Jay's thoughts on this, too, because he was mentioning, you know, you were mentioning earlier just some things that you guys um, are trying to do and, and sort of give a tactile edge to this digital reality we're in. You know, for us at our church, we haven't hit on some sort of gold mine of like, you know, breakthrough, like, oh, this is the way we can make digital feel more analog. We're just sort of, we're constantly asking other churches, like, what are you guys doing? Just trying to get ideas. And, but, and maybe, maybe that's a giant gift to this whole thing is just that spirit of collaboration and like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you it know, has been, yeah, it has been the, you know, yeah. Yeah. It has been in the Silicon Valley. I'm on a zoom chat every Tuesday with uh, uh, like 20, you know, pastors from the area. And like, we've never had anything like that before, but we're all on this Zoom chat together because, you know, crisis has this incredible way of drawing people together. This guy named Sebastian Younger, who's a a, a journalist, he has a book called Tribe, short little book called Tribe. Really fascinating. He just goes through like crisis after crisis in world history and, and tracks how it brought people together. And I think that's true. I'm experiencing it in real time time here and um but yeah you know that that's definitely a gift just sort of the unifying effect of this strange time that that we're in uh yeah i mean we we had 
the guy I, I serve alongside and lead the church with, um, we had some long conversations about the Eucharist and communion and trying to figure out like, okay, what is our theology? And, and, you know, like on this, is it okay for us to do it digitally? How does that work? And what, what do you come up with on that? Well, long story short, we've decided, so our, in our church, we, uh, take the bread and the cup every Sunday as we've gathered, you know, in terms of like our normal before COVID-19, we, we, that was the centerpiece of our gathering. Always we would sort of land there. Um, and so along those lines, we've just continued that. So we ask our people to bring some bread and uh, the cup and at the end of the gathering, you know, on Facebook live, uh, we just all, we take the bread and the cup together. And um, I've had some interesting conversations with some folks on online, like on Twitter about that. And it's been pretty fascinating, you know, some of the pushback and um, the guy who wrote the forward in my book, a guy named Scott McKnight, uh, has some thoughts on it, and it's just been fascinating. So we're still he's, wrestling. With he's it. a he's a very convinced Anglican these days, which he totally. hasn't always been. Yeah, that's right. No, we that's right. we've done something similar. Huh? I'll tell you the the most surprising technology that I've always hated that I now am thankful for is an analog technology. It is a stupid little uh, communion cups that are yeah. like individual cups, and I think they're heretical, right? Like <laughs> un, under normal circumstances. Yeah. But but uh, on Sunday afternoons now, I'm able to minister on a distance basis to some of our. Um, I kind of have coined them for myself, digital shut-ins people mm -hmm. because we're a neighborhood church. We do potluck every week in, in addition as an extension of communion every week. Mm -hmm. But um, we, we definitely have a handful of people who don't have access to technology or Wi-Fi, um, can't be a part of our zoom gatherings. And so I'll go to the front steps of the church. We'll space out. I'll see everyone on a one-to-one -one basis and, and man, to be able to physically minister with masks and gloves, you know, I felt like a, a surgeon on Easter Sunday with a tie and mask and gloves. But yeah. um, I'm thankful for that technology. And, and I would say, you know, I am using it kind of with fear and trembling and with the recognition that this is not the best thing, which is also we're doing communion like y'all, like gather from your pantry, something that approximates bread and cup, mm -hmm. you know, Easter Sunday, it was a biscuit because we're in the South. Right. Uh, <laughs> but uh, do I think that's ideal? Not at all. But, you know, um, I think by paying attention to um, what, what we're kind of forced to do these days can actually also like highlight some of the beauty of that, that sacrament is, you know, the idea that Jesus, you know, the text for this Sunday, the lectionary text is the John 20, when Jesus appears in, in a locked room to uh, the disciples and Thomas in a very tactile way must feel Jesus, uh, his wounds aside. Um, Jesus appears to them in lockdown uh, behind locked doors. So I, I think I'm okay with, communion coming to our people in lockdown, you know, yeah. that, that their tables might be the Lord's table in some mysterious way that the meal is always mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, it's beautiful, man. Yeah. I love it. Chris, do you want me to share a couple things we're doing? Yeah, I'd love that. So yeah, communion has got to be one of the, I think, stress tests for whatever we talk about. It's 
the most that and baptism in our tradition are the kind of the two big sacraments. Um, you know, one of the critiques of technology is that the context collapse, that it sort of doesn't honor that, la that language of space and time. And we've tried really hard to maintain context in, in a disembodied world. So like, again, we're doing a lot of audio and not a lot of video for our Sunday morning liturgy. And there, I do think there's something really, really intimate about speaking so close to someone's ear that I think actually can be quite close and so but we've also added in field recordings into a lot of our audio so that there's a sense of place so you know i'll like to get on my roof with the with a hand recorder and just capture morning birds and traffic and texture that back into our audio we have started having our pastors who are doing daily encouragements do those walking so that you get a sense of place and it kind of creates this soundscape of our location um pasadena the 210 you know as we spread out across los angeles you can feel a little bit of what it's like to be in those spaces. And I actually think there's an opportunity there to rebuild a context with a technology. Um, and, but we're doing it through sound. One of the things we've struggled with is as we've done our music, like my wife and I both sing and play. And then our worship pastor who's down the street in Glendora, uh, she's running half of the music. We run half the music. And we started using like a recording booth and it started to feel really stale. The first couple of weeks, my wife and I just threw a guitar and a microphone up and played. It was atemporal. There was no click track and it felt really human. And as we got what we thought were getting better, we were actually getting, I think, more cold. And so we keep moving back to sort of whatever it is that can be clumsy and that can be human. I want to keep that in. And technology does allow us like we have a little button right here, the three buttons on top where we can fix our appearance right on Zoom. And this attempt, it's really tempting to do that with everything, to auto-tune our voices and to, to mix out mistakes. And we're trying to leave those edges a little bit frayed. And that's been helpful. And the only other thing I'll say is um, we're, we're in the free church tradition. And so this idea of needing an ecclesial authority figure to administer sacraments or to be the only ones in charge of spiritual formation just isn't true for us. And so the home is itself like, a spiritual sacred location and often people have kind of atrophied to their own priesthood in their homes and so to be able to speak to them in their homes and say like to take them on a walking prayer for instance which we've done a couple of times now and allow them to move through their dwellings and blessing like we can talk about that in the sanctuary on a Sunday but we can do that with them when we understand that they are sheltering in place too it's a huge gift that we all are experiencing a similarity across the board, it allows the precision, I think, of our work to be just at a different level than it normally is. So where we can, we embrace this strange situation, um, but always, and Chris, you said it earlier, any way that we can make this thing human, and I think that's the language of analog, whether it's drawing our own stuff or taking our own pictures or our own location field recordings um, or our musicians, right, all of that, I think, keeps the community at the forefront and allows it to have those affordances, I think that uh, is another language that I, I like a lot. Um, that's just some of the stuff we're doing. I don't know if it's right, but it feels wrong. It feels true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so f first off, John Jay, you're, you've turned into such a Californian uh, naming your your roads. You, you talked about the, the 210. <laughs> that's a very Californian thing that I, I hadn't known about you before now. Um, but uh, <laughs> Jay, in, in your book, you mentioned, I thought it was really fascinating, you mentioned um, you have a lot of these kind of dichotomies that you bring up, uh, things like uh, transcendence versus rele relevance. And like, I, I kind of sense some of these coming into this time of relying more on technology than I'm normally comfortable with is kind of how John Jay said it. And I, I agree with that. Um, things like uh, I said, communion over content or participation over production quality. And John Jay was kind of talking about that. But um you talk about hype and happiness versus joy and mourning. And I think there's probably like a um, commodification kind of um, there's, there's a market force happening there and why like high tech iterations of church don't tend to be very sad. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because it's better ratings for making mm -hmm. people feel good. Right. <laughs> um, but also like, it seemed like you went as far to say that, that, you know, uh, more analog versions of church are better at confession 
uh, better at both joy and mourning. And um, I really love the way um, that fits with the analog metaphor that you're using. You know, like um, when you think of sound quality and, you know, a vinyl record is, is, you know, normally produced like onto tape originally and then pressed into grooves and vinyl rather than compressed using like compression technology that narrows your bandwidth. And so the idea that our, that analog anything, whether it's sound or church is a wider bandwidth, uh, I, I think is beautiful. Um, can you say a little bit more about some of those thoughts that, that, that you wrote about that in your book in terms of in your experience with confession? Um, maybe even now, yeah, you know, digital, I mean, this is in the book, but the digital age, I think, is built on three key values. And one of those key values is speed. And uh, everything has to be faster. So if we think back to, you know, when, when we first started using internet in our homes and we all got dial up, you know, and it was like so slow and loud and mechanical, you know, and, and, uh, and then if, you know, your mom jumped on a phone call, you lost internet connection and you were angry and, and yet still it was like magical, right? Then you had access to this whole world of information and websites were just so they, you know, now in hindsight, they were so archaic, but that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> like that was, you know, when I was in finishing up high school, early college, like that was my world was dial up. And now, you know, a short 18, 20 years later, it's like, dude, dial up. If I went to a friend's house and they use dial up, I'd be like, what, <laughs> what, dude, what is wrong with you? You know, <laughs> like, uh, so it's fascinating when you think about that value speed and the way that value sort of infiltrated is I think the word I would use sort of infiltrated the way we think about church and, and our ecclesiology. You know, when I'm talking about hype and happiness, um, sort of replacing the the broader breadth of joy and, and mourning, uh, you know, part of it is I, re I read this article uh, a few months back about SoundCloud, you know, the application SoundCloud and, and artists who are putting their music on SoundCloud. And I guess there, I don't know, but um, from the article, what I read was that there's a whole there's an entire science behind how you structure a song for SoundCloud based on the algorithm of advertising. And, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so it has to be a certain length, and it's actually pretty short. It's like the sweet spot is to write a song that gets – I think like 120 to 180. So like two to two and a half minutes. That's the sweet spot. If you go over two and a half minutes on a song, you're in trouble. Like you're going to lose all the monetization capability because what the research is showing is that people aren't going to listen for that long. They're going to go to the next song because they have an endless array of choices, which means they never get to the advertisement piece, which means that you don't get money for them. So there are all these you know, artists who post their music on SoundCloud and literally their art is dictated by the commodification of the art, right? Like they're, they're writing a two to two and a half minute song, not because the song that's, that's being birthed out of them demands two to two and a half minutes. It's because that's what's required to get the money or whatever, you know? And um, so that, that's fascinating to me because what that means then, and this is all in the article, what that means is like the verse Verses are much shorter. Uh, the intro is all is like a build to a big drop, and then you're getting to a huge sort of payoff chorus pretty quick because you're trying to limit the song in terms of length. And I share that because I think that that's what's happening in our churches. <laughs> you know, like we have to, and this is like this is actually born in some ways out of the broadcast age. The church has always sort of followed suit with the greatest, the newest technologies of the day. So in the mid 20th century when television started finding their way into every American home and then broadcast television sort of being filmed in, in 
television studios where they were segmented with like a five minute or 15 minute intro and then a commercial break and then a little 10 minute segment and then another commercial break. Well, like if you go on, you know, planning center or whatever, like that's how all of our church services are designed now. It's like 15 minutes of songs and then you have announcements, which is a commercial break. And then you have a 10 minute little like deal, you know, maybe a reading or something and then a little break. And, um, and we do, I'm not saying that's bad. I mean, we use planning center at our church to sort of be organized and, and on the same page, but you know, when the sort of speed and commodification mechanisms dictate the thing that you're creating, then you're no longer creating anything of real substance. In my opinion, you're, you're allowing the sort of structure to dictate uh, the thing that you're making. And when it comes to like the formation of a soul and the formation of a community, you know, it's way more art than it is science, right? It's way more, um, painting than it is a 30 minute television program. Uh, and, and I, I'm afraid that because everything has become commodified and sped up in the digital age and the church. So many of our churches have sort of recklessly leaned into that posture. It's I'm afraid that when I walk into a church service, like so often, you know, just standard modern Western evangelical church service before anything happens, I can almost tell you what's going to happen. You know what I mean? And that's a bummer because that's, man, that's not life. And so life isn't like that, right? And yet we're communicating to our people, to our congregations, that when they show up to be the gathered people of God, that that's what it's like to follow Jesus, the sort of predictable, we're going to sing a couple of songs, and then the chorus and the bridge is going to make you feel really great because God loves you as an individual or whatever, you know, and then read this one little verse from the gospel of John, and you're going to know that God loves you so much and everything's going to be okay, and then you walk out the door and go on about another week. Like it's just so predictable and it's not, it's not life. You know, it doesn't have the breadth and the scope of real life, which is confusing and surprising and unexpected all the time. And um, so that's what I'm trying to get at, right? Like this whole, like, let's just make people, let's hype them up and make them feel happy is that's the language of commodification. And what we need to do is like understand in life, there is mourning and then there's deep joy. And then there's a million things in between those two things. And we just have to create environments and spaces and opportunities for our people to bring all of that and, uh, and to embody all of that together. Um, I think that's what it means to be the church. Praise the mountain and the bay. All the gifts that still remain But the greatest gift of all And the law above all laws Is to love your friends and lovers To lay down your life for your brothers as you abide in peace so your delight increase when i first started trying to write little essays and articles about this i felt really demoralized because i felt like i was screaming into a pillow and now your voice and other voices are popping up in in theological and spiritual spaces. You know, you mentioned Tristan Harris and others, uh, Sherry Turkle, like this has been Neil Postman. The people have been talking about this for a while, um, but it's really, really heartening to hear how you're working this out on the ground. Um, I'll just offer as my last thought here. So Jonathan Franzen wrote a set of essays called The End of the End of the Earth. And in there, he's got one called Capitalism and Hyperdrive on Sherry Turkle. And he's basically, he's, He's saying yes, and also, Turkle, you didn't take this far enough. What you really are critiquing in your, um, com- you know, in your books about technology and loneliness is capitalism, and you just won't come out and say it. And I've heard us kind of dancing that line a little bit with market values and commodification. And one of the ways that I've found really helpful to think about this is 
there's a book by Lewis Hyde called The Gift, which is like essential reading for artists, but really I think for pastors as well. It's become the way we, th we think about generosity more generally at our church, but also what we do um, is not a product, but as a gift offering back to the world. And it takes all of those incentives that normally are driving church. You mentioned it, efficiency, speed, growth, you know, reduction of friction, homogenization that make this thing leverageable and marketable. And it sets them aside and brings a whole new set of values into conversation, which are, you know, community building and cohesion and quirkiness. And, and that book has been for me, I think, like a guide that I hold all of the time. And it allows us to make decisions as a congregation and us as a staff driven by by the thing that we're doing is a gift to the world and our community, not as a thing that we're hoping they will leverage, like not treating our church as another multi-level marketing group that's going to spread our message in a way um, that boosts our ego. And I keep coming back to that book, usually a few times a year and reread it just because it's it's been so helpful to reorient what it is we're actually doing when we work out liturgies together, when we offer the bread and cup, when we speak, like even for me, right, for all of us who, who are preachers, like our voices are part of our gift. That's part of what we hand out to the world. And so to keep it in that space all the time of a gift economy rather than a market economy, doesn't mean everything in the world has to exist in a gift economy, but I do think the church must, um, or it atrophies. And I'm just so, again, I would just say again, like I'm so heartened. Chris, I love, I always love following what you're doing because I think you have existed in this space, this kind of collision of human texture and art and deep theology for so long that I'm always inspired when I peek in. And now I've got Jay here, a new friend that I think is working in these same kind of ways. Uh, and I, I do believe that there's a groundswell of looking for this, of, of gift economies for church and not just market driven economies. Um, whether we say it explicitly or not, we are not playing the same game as late stage capitalism where the numbers have to go up and to the right all the time. Like that's just not the, that's not what we're doing. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Wow. Well, I don't have much to follow up on that. <laughs> that was it. That was it right there. Yeah. I guess, you know, just to tag on, I would say to the person listening, uh, Along those lines, I haven't read the Hyde book. I've heard of it, but now, now that you mention it again, John J, I, I just typed it in and, and uh, in my notes, and I'm going to order it and read it. Um, yeah, I would say along those lines, you know, the digital age has this propensity for pushing us in the direction of uh, comparison, which eventually turns into contempt. And, and then it can turn us into sometimes copycats, which eventually leads us to becoming just total caricatures. Like we're no longer fully human. We're just these like weird caricatures of versions of humans that we see on our digital screens. And then we've, we've just completely lost what it means to be me, you know, and us as a people. And I guess that's what I would say, like your gift to the world is not for you to look sound and be like whatever the glossy, shiny thing you saw on wherever, uh, but to discover um, the, the unique embodied incarnational ways in which, you know, the Imago Dei in you, the way that God has formed and shaped you in his image, you know, and uh, that's hard work. It's difficult work. It's the work of the artist. And some people are listening to this being like, I'm not an artist, I'm an accountant or whatever, you know, but, um, but the reality is like, it's all art. Like your life is a piece, you know, it's a, it's a piece that you are working on constantly as you craft it. And the reason I say it's art is because there is no Ikea instruction manual for it. If it was a science, there would be. And then it would just sap all of the excitement and uh, exhilaration out of living. It would just be like, hey, step 1A, take this peg and put it into this hole. And everyone would just live the same life, you know? And we see this in like all the dystopian books and uh, novels and movies that we watch. It's like, that's what it would look like if it was easy. And if it was a science, you know? And, uh, so I think inherently we know that. And that's what I would say, like, man, offer the gift of your life to the world, which means you have to do the hard work of not just comparing yourself and being angry that your life doesn't look like that person's Instagram feed. Uh, but instead discover the beauty and the goodness and the struggle of your unique life. And that is your gift to be offered to 
the world. And um, man, if followers of Jesus can do that, then I have immense hope for the future, you know, the present and the future. Well, thanks for the gifts of your lives and for the gift of this conversation, friends. And thanks for being in this good, slow work together. Yeah. Peace. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. Bye, friends. special music for today's episode comes from the welcome wagon oftentimes we feature new music or kind of under the radar music but this music's a little older and a little more well known but we figured if we're gonna have three pastors on the pod this week we might as well have four and uh pastor Vito Ayuto is pastoring in Brooklyn at Resurrection Williamsburg and making awesome music with his wife Monique under the moniker The Welcome Wagon. And this has really been a quarantine soundtrack for me personally. I love to get to share it with you all. And our theme music is always uh, The Old Ark's Moving by A.A. Gray and The Seven Foot Dilly. And then our outro music is Jesus Said by David Childers. And if you're a fan of RTN Theology, you can help us reach a bigger audience and put this show literally on the map by giving us a, a review and rating us uh, five stars on iTunes. Until next time, take care. Take care.